And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have not one but two newcomers to the temple. In the red, in the red corner, we have we have the pa the patron saint of Arca of Arcanus, the one and only Henry Lopez, and in the blue corner we have the we have the rules guru for the currently kickstarting Codex of the Mind, and co and co -author, co author on Codex of the Mind alongside Henry Lopez, the one and only and I apologize for not rolling my R's in advance, Pedro Barranchea. Hello. How you how you two doing today? Awesome. Thank you very much for having us on. Thank thank you for thank you for coming on and thank thank you for um dealing with time zone juggling alongside me. Not, Fair not enough. Our pleasure. <laughs> so one of the traditions around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. And with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, respectively, and what made it stick. Hmm. You first, Henry. Okay. Well, I've been playing since 1976, I think it is. Mm -hmm. When I happened to, uh, out of the blue, I happened to call up a friend of mine that I've known since elementary school and said, what are you doing? And he had uh, family up in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin. And on the drive back, um, well, they went over the summer, they went and visited their family. And over the, uh, on the drive back, they had picked up the white box for D&D. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we're just te uh, testing this new game out. I want to come over. So, so I uh, went over and started playing, and, and the rest is history. I've been a fan of uh, sci-fi and, and uh, fantasy games since I was a little boy. I've been reading stories since forever, Robert E. Howard, um, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, it was a perfect uh, uh, mix of, of both uh, literature and, uh, and uh, basically telling my own story before there was a Tell your own story, kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the rest is history. After that, you know, I went into uh, other things, but I've always kept my toe in the the role playing game. Um, uh, I won't say industry because I didn't have until later, but the role playing uh, hobby. Mm -hmm. And since I've always been a fan of uh, telling stories and writing stories and and whatnot, and GMing for well since the seventies, um, it was a natural fit for me to to gather a uh, few of my, my best friends, and we started uh, Paranormal Concepts, and of course, Arcanus. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where I started. That's my secret origin. <laughs> um, so I get I guess that counts as your issue number one. Yeah. That, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so my story, um, I've always dealt with ADD and dyslexia when I was a little mm -hmm. kid. I really did not like reading. And there was a teacher uh, who insisted on trying to find something I wanted to read. She tried comic books, tried a few other books. And one day she gave me a book called The Hobbit. I blew through it in a weekend, walked back into her room, threw it on her desk and said, more. <laughs> Apparently that attracted the attention of some of the older kids in the class because we were on a special education class. Mm -hmm who had been playing D&D. So they thought, oh my God, this little kid just read The Hobbit in a weekend. Let's invite him into our D&D game. And it was the red box, um, basic D&D red box where like all the races were classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up playing after school in the Boy Scout Club, which they dragged me into. Um, and ever since then, I've been playing one role-playing game or another, mostly D&D, &D, um, my entire life. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that, um, that, brings me to, that brings me to the creation of the setting of Arcanus, the world of Shattered Empires, which I, I will freely admit my first, in, my first introduction to the reason I ended up finding out about it was I was, was, I was digging around for... So for something that was that had some influences of antiquity, Greco-Roman and the like, but wasn't trying to go for a more historical approach. Um, and one thing led to another, and and 
um, Arcanus ended up getting brought to my attention. Um, how did how did the setting come to be? Because this is this is a setting that's gone through several um, iterations over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that was basically a story that that I've had uh, uh, in my head. The story came before the setting, uh, mm -hmm. the first story arc that I wanted to do, and I've always been a fan of um, ancient Roman history, uh, mm -hmm. specifically the uh, the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I agree uh, with you in the sense of a lot of the uh, those who um, go for a historical setting, um, he, uh, you know, hew fairly close to the actual uh, history that in, on Earth, which is great. Uh, however, I have learned over the years that if you're doing a historical game, if your table doesn't have at least people who are who are uh, interested or or conversant with that period of history, it becomes a lot of info dumping. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the other extreme where you have somebody who has a PhD in whatever <laughs> historical uh, time period you're working on, and they're like, oh, that's not historically accurate. You know, whatnot. So what we thought was the, the best uh, of both worlds was to take it and then um, put it in a fantasy uh, setting. Take the, the, the portions that we liked. For example, I mean, I'm a big fan of legions. Um, I love the whole, you know, uh, intrigue and, and political backstabbing of, of ancient Rome and, and Byzantium. And from there, it became the Coriani Empire. And there's a lot of analogs and a lot of parallels, but it's not the same thing. So nobody can say, well, that's not historically accurate because it's not Rome. It's not Byzantium. It's not whatever, you know, whatever it is. But uh, it started um, as from a publishing point of view. It, studied, it started uh, in the year uh, 2000. Um, actually, yeah, the year 2000. Uh, this is our 20th uh, anniversary, although it started in 2000. It was October of 2000, really, when we incorporated. And, but we first published uh, our product, which was Spirit of Love in a little 32-page adventure um, in 2001, making, uh, making this our 20th anniversary. And um, like I said, we started with a little 32-page a little adventure, made a second 32-page adventure. Well, that one sold out, and then it kind of snowballed. People wanted to know more and more about the history. And as I mentioned before, I'm a big uh, Robert E. Howard fan. Uh, I've read just about anything and everything uh, of his, plus, you know, Tolkien and all the other, you know, staples of fantasy. And I basically cherry picked what I enjoyed of the setting and put it all together. And uh, one of the things that, that always bothered me um, in settings of either, you know, homebrew settings or, or published or whatever was, why are these dungeons there? What is the rationale? Mm -hmm. um, why does why is it populated? Why is it like this? Why is it like that? So, I built up a I don't know about ten thousand year you know history in broad strokes, and the reason it's called Arcanus, the World of the Shattered Empires, is because it's empire after empire after empire that rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell, and what's left behind the remnants of that are the dungeons, are the ancient crypts, are the places that they they are exploring that the players are exploring. And therefore, there's a rationale. So you just don't walk into, you know, a plain quarter. You we walk into a corner that has frescoes detailing the the rise and fall of the you know of, of the uh, Sethar Warren Empire, the Esther Warren Empire original, mm -hmm. and which are the 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 serpent folk and whatnot that existed before and whatnot, and and everything kind of snowballed from there. It was uh, Arcanus is more story driven uh, than most of the settings. I won't say all settings because I don't know all the settings. But as far as uh, most settings, it's it's more story driven um, than just pure combat. Which is not to say there isn't combat. There's pretty brutal combat um, in our, our adventures. But it's always been more of of what is the what is the, the story behind the story. Mm -hmm. uh, when I created Arcanus, it was I followed the onion method, uh, which is you know you peel back a question. Or, or, or you answer a question and you peel back the onion and bam, there's another layer. Well, what does this mean? So every question that's answered gives you another two questions. And mm -hmm. that really involved people. People responded to that and they enjoyed it. And the rest is history. 20 years later, we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. now, that, that now, that brings me to, the, to this particular endeavor, um, Codex of the Mind, yep. which... Um, as I, understand, as I understand it, is is made is made both for, at, both as an expansion for Arcanus 
and as a psionic expansion for whatever for whatever setting the um, table wants to use it for. Correct. Yep. Correct. Uh, our, uh, psionics was never a tack on to the setting. Psionics was integral to the setting from its inception. Uh, we wanted it to, uh, uh, I've, I've always been a big fan of psionics mm -hmm. and I wanted it to have, um, an integrated feeling. I wanted the magic of science to be a little different from the magic of arcane magic and, uh, and um, divine magic and what we call primal, which is the, the shamanistic, uh, magic. We have four different types of magic that we've broken apart and each has its own specific, uh, feel, uh, to it. And, um, for better or worse, uh, there hasn't really been uh, a deep dive into psionics um, by uh, Watsi as, as they did in third edition and I believe fourth for whatever reason. And uh, it was a void that we felt that we needed to do for mm -hmm. our own system. And we thought other people you know, would enjoy it. Yep. And as you said, it, it is written for the Arcana setting. But again, you know, if you've been jamming for you know any amount of time, it's it's an old staple that you take what you like, you file off the serial numbers, and you include it in your own campaign. Yes. So the reason we can we can say it's it's good for you know a generic or or a, a, you know whatever system uh, that you like to do your your D and D game is because if you don't like the Val families that are psionically awakened on Arcanus, then you jettison them, and you still have you know three brand new classes, fifty subclasses, and tons of feats, spells, and, and whatnot, runic. Mm -hmm. Uh, psionic runes and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You just, like I said, just file off the serial numbers. You know, you don't like, um, you don't like uh, the silence, uh, the, the servants of oblivion. Well, then just get rid of it and, and tack them out to mind flayers. You know, we weren't allowed to use mind flayers, uh, obviously, because they're, they're not part of the OGL. So we came up with our own thing, you know, the voiceless ones, and um, and wrap them up into this this um, uh, concept of oblivion being sentient. And they're the, they're one of the servants of oblivion, and they happen to be psionic. They're preternaturally psionic, and that's the conflict between psionics, you know, for the quote unquote good. But as you know, in Arcanus, no one is ever lily white good or or you know evil evil. Um, but it's it's that conflict between the two. All right, and that's why we decided to come up with a codex of the mind. Um, now the net now um. This brings this brings me to the to the big um, elephant in the in the room since we're talking about psionics. Okay. Um, psionics has a, has had a very checkered history when it comes to D and D over the years. Um, there was the there were the various attempts in the early days of AD and D that never quite worked, and some of them were very contentious to say the least. Oh God, yes. <laughs> uh, um, there were um, there were. This this particular tradition made made them all made them equally very scub in third edition, fourth edition I think I think um I think what I think was some had it manages it managed to work within its particular approach and do something interesting, mm -hmm. but but um well I, I, I can every time I bring up fourth edition I can already hear a, a wave of keyboard <laughs> warriors over the fact that I deign to not hate fourth edition like I'm supposed to but to that I say fuck you I do what I want. <laughs> um and the and the it, the attempt to the attempt at psionics that was first in Unearthed Arcana got um a lot of backlash for how not well thought out it was with with the whole I I'm just a, I'm just a wizard with, who casts spells with my mind which nobody bought. Yeah, uh, it, it it was it was a bland attempt at doing psionics but trying to keep it within the mechanic the mechanics of fifth edition mm -hmm. um and that's one thing that worked in fourth fourth was such a mechanically tight system that they were able to do psionics make them feel different but not break the system yeah um in 3.5 and 3.0 the problem they had with powerpoints is that a lot of players and gms really didn't follow all the rules it was easy to forget the little rules and as soon as you forgot the little rules, it became overpowered. Of course, it didn't help that the third edition that um, Monty Cook in his third edition days had a ma had a massive massive boner for giving for giving more spells to wizards and wizards, clerics, and druids. Yes. Um. um but still, scions 
because of the point based system were in they weren't you're right they didn't have all the abilities of all the other classes but what they were good at they were broken at if you didn't follow every single rule with the point based system yeah um, we we had a living campaign that lasted six years and when uh, you have psionics being used just like, just to be clear the living campaign oh, yeah not, sorry uh, it's continuing you're right we had a living we're campaign storyline sorry <laughs> we had one storyline that lasted uh six years mm -hmm. uh six continuous years and the players found every single loophole in 3.5 and the stuff that i witnessed in psionics yeah yeah it was bonkers but 3.5 was designed to be bonkers anyways it, it was that was the the theme behind it it was designed um, to be bonkers if you're a caster if you were a uh, if you were if you were not a, if you were not a caster then you were then you were effectively the th the um third wheel or as my mentor would say you were a spare prick at the wedding oh, oh we actually wrote a whole bunch of stuff Back in 3.5, actually, mm -hmm. we wrote a bunch of stuff to help fighters, like fighting styles, mm -hmm. that made them keep up with the casters. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, Psionics has always been the kind of like the, uh, like, uh, God, if you go back to second edition Psionics, <laughs> second edition Psionics, though, was really interesting. It was, again, kind of bonkers mm -hmm. um so and like every time somebody except for fourth edition they tried to do psionics they tried to do it so different from the rest of the system that always felt like a tack on if you know what i mean it never felt like it was part of the game yeah and um to to be fair um i've i've spoken with i've spoken with some of with some with some former tsr people and they and all of them have Flat out admitted that they tr that um they tried but they could never get but even they weren't satisfied with how it turned out. Fair enough. Um, I've al I've always been of I've always been of the opinion that the reason why Psionics has such a has as such an issue is be is because of the fact that it doesn't really it doesn't really fit within within the aesthetic that D and D is tr has been has been trying to do with its with its particular inspirations and. Whenever, um, whenever Psionics is used in, say, sci in a lot of sci-fi settings, it's basically wizards that don't want to admit it. <laughs> Fair. I mean, what is a Jedi if not a if not a space wizard that multiclassed into samurai? <laughs> Fair point. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, with so with that kind of thing in mind, um, give me give me the. Give me and the people in the temple the skinny on how you guys are tackling the psionic question. So, we've when we first came at psionics, we wanted to come up with a good story-based reason why it was different, and then build the mechanics off of that, but on top of the 5e framework. Um, so, Henry, do you want to give a shot on how psionics works in a story-based element, then I go into the mechanics? Sure, I can do that, but I, I think I, I, unless I'm, I'm misunderstanding, I think you're, you're looking more from a, from a mechanics point of view. What do we do different? How do we... Yeah, is that what you want, or you want the story first and the mechanics? Um, I think, uh, given, the, given the fact that um, the, reason why, the reason why I mentioned that whole not fitting is when you look at we look at the th the things that were an inspiration for D and D. There's not really a representation of sci of psionics. Fair enough. Um, I do th I do think in that regard we should we should handle the narrative part of it first and then the mechanical part of it. Oh, okay, sure. All right. So uh, let me give you a brief, uh, very very brief uh, description of how magic works because it all all works together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's four sources of magic as we call it. Um, arcane, divine, primal, and psionics. Arcane magic is basically the taking and and forming or reforming the residual energy left over from the moment of creation to create your magical effect. Mm -hmm. okay. It's um, it's the if if the residual energy of creation is like a, a if it's a faucet, you're basically tapping into a little drip that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it goes through your body, obviously, and, and those things. Story-wise, 
Um, it also can can kill you, uh, but that's more of a story thing, not a mechanical thing that we have. Um, the more you use it, the more your body kind of wears out and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Divine is different in the sense of it works in the in the it works by rote. You're given prayers, if you will, miracles, if you will, mm-hmm. um, by whatever you know the temples, um, and they say that you know, the priests got them from you know uh, previous iterations from uh, Valinor, who are kind of like our angels or the gods themselves, whatnot. And you you have to do it in a certain way, right? So if you cast a I don't know um, a lightning bolt, for example, because you're a you know, a priest of of the god uh, Hurion, who's the god of storm and, and whatnot. Um, it's always the same way. There's absolutely no manipulation of that lightning bolt. The lightning bolt will do, you know, X amount of damage. I mean, it's a variable of the dice rolling. But it will always do, you know, whatever it is, you know, 66 or whatever, whatever it might be. And it will always go that far and it will do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Whereas if you're doing the arcane, you... You have a, a bit more, um, um, a bit of the, uh, of the ability to manipulate it and change it. Maybe you can fork it and hit two targets instead of just one. Maybe you can uh, make it into a ball and do like an area effect. Yeah. So there's there's different variations that you can do uh, with spell if you're an arcane caster as opposed to divine. However, uh, divine casters have the the benefit of being um, very reliable. Their spells are very reliable. They will never fail. Right. So they have you know bonuses uh, you know somehow for a concentration or whatever it is that Pete can 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 speak to. Primal spells is a person who has absolutely no magical talent whatsoever, and then they um, basically worship a uh, a spirit, a greater spirit who's not mm-hmm. a god, but uh, like the spirit of the river or or whatever the spirit of war or whatnot, and that person grants you powers uh, through boons, it's sort of like a, a shaman. And then lastly, we have the sciences, which we call the awakened. And the the awakened are specifically in Arcanus, uh, a, a sub-variation of the human species called the Val. And the Vals uh, are scions of the gods. And there are particular families that are directly uh, descended from supposedly these gods from antiquity. And um, because of that, they have biologically speaking uh, an extra gland in their mind in their head basically in their brain and mm-hmm. that allows them to tap into instead of like the drip from the faucet they can tap into the actual you know keg if you will and uh, manipulate it with their mind so their willpower their force of personality depending on what they what they do it can either be peter can speak to it more but sometimes the pervading uh, uh stat is charisma sometimes it's intelligence sometimes it's wisdom depending on what they're doing and um from a story basis, it limits you to only that that uh, uh, sub race, if you will, or, or, or branch of, of the of the human species can do psionics, as opposed to, for example, one of my favorite uh, settings, uh, Dark Sun, mm-hmm. where everybody's psionic or everybody has a psionic talent. This is a little bit more limited in that respect. Um, but again, if you're using it for something like Dark Sun or anybody else, you just you know get rid of that rule. But in Arcanus, that's the that's the rule. Um, or that's the, the story uh, portion of it. And obviously there are other uh, species that can do science. For example, the, the serpent folk, the, the Sanu, as we call them, mm-hmm. uh, they they uh, are biomancers because they're so ancient. So they gave themselves the ability to do that, that they stole from another uh, species called the, the Sanu, or the, I'm sorry, uh, the Sancho, who are our, our halflings, if you will, which mm-hmm. I'm not a big halfling fan. So uh, just like the gnomes, who I was never a big fan of the gnomes, I did horrible things to them. <laughs> and uh, the Sancho were wiped out by the by the Sanus and the Sethrics, which are the reptilian races, and, but they took that ability and bioengineered it into themselves. Mm-hmm. And But humanity has another flavor of it, if you will. And uh, that's it. From, from a story point of view, that's that's where, where Peter, I guess, will come in then and uh, tell you about the mechanics of what that, that all means mechanically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, the idea behind uh, the way they manifest their spells and stuff is that they have the unique ability to split their consciousness mm-hmm. into separate shards, separate little focuses. 
So the, the, the class is kind of built upon the chassis of the warlock where you have focused abilities, which are almost like evocations mm -hmm. that as long as one of your mental foci are focused on that ability, that ability is active. Now you have psionic powers that you can use at will that work like cantrips, but every psionic power has something called an expression, which could be a unique ability or a spell that you could express. Mm -hmm. You have to cannibalize one of your psionic focuses, shutting down one of your powers to manifest that ability. Mm -hmm. So let's say that uh, you're a scion and you have um, two focused abilities. One gives you dark vision and the other one uh, gives you, let's go with the theme, gives you advantage on uh, perception rolls as long as you're focused. Now, you could use your telekinetic blast to just do a normal two, 1d8 attack, or you could blow an expression to up the damage of that attack. Um, the focuses work like the spell level for a warlock mm -hmm. that go from level one to five same thing depending on your level anything that you use a focus on anything you express is expressed at that spell level so you could so a pyrokinetic could express fireball and if they're let's say 10th level they manifest it at fifth level ability just like a warlock would Oh, all right. Now, with it, with that kind of thing in mind, what um a a a common tra a common trap that can so that can sometimes happen, and this is the re and the reason why the um why the set why the um attempt attempt in unearthed arcana got lampooned so hard is there there's the temptation to have to have wit to have um to have them not to have them downstream from um from wit from more arcane spellcasters. Yes. Um how do you how do you make sure that that do, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, we use spells as uh we do have where they express spells, but the psionic powers don't work quite like spells on a lot of cases. For for example, um uh, uh, telekinetic bolt, right? Mm -hmm. It normally does as much damage as a cantrip. But after you hit a target and you use your expression, it almost works, works like a ranged smite and you throw the target backwards. So it's not really following a spell format at all. If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And... um. There's other sonic abilities like um, mind. Um, uh, God, it's called. There's one that you could create a mind link with somebody for a short term to send them one message. But if you use your sonic focus, you could create a link with that person for a number of hours equal to your spell focus, uh, equal to your manifestation level. It doesn't work. It's not a spell in the book. It's kind of unique, but at higher levels, at way higher level, if you manifest it, you could create a link with up to a number of of, of uh, creatures equal to your uh, manifesting ability score modifier. Mm -hmm. So as you go up in level, what your power does changes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always, sometimes it has manifest this spell because in that case, it was easier just to refer you to that spell. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of powers that have their own unique expressions. Um, there's one I really like, Burst of Speed, which uh, as a bonus action, you could add five, ten feet to your movement, right? Mm -hmm. But at higher levels, when you use an expression, you could run on water. All right. Now, that br now um. With that in mind, I'd like to go into the three base classes that you're adding that that are utilizing this system. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what I'm what I'm especially curious about is how, is how each of them is going to differentiate from the other and what niches they're filling before you get into the um, the monkey wrench that is subclasses. Fair enough. So the first one of the three we'll start with is the scion. Well, we're gonna have to discuss, especially with the scion subclasses, a little bit because mm-hmm. the scion is unique in one one part compared to the other two. Your subclass determines what your manifesting attribute is. So the class is not charisma based. Mm -hmm. Depending on which archetype you pick, like, for example, there's one called the Savant, which I was totally inspired by Sherlock Holmes when I wrote it. They're they're geniuses and Mm -hmm. they see things different than other people. Well, they use intelligence. Well, uh, another sub, another archetype subclass would pro- uses wisdom. Another one uses charisma, depending on the flavor of the archetype. The scion is the the toolbox of all three classes. They're the ones that get the most psionic powers, and they learn the most focused abilities. They are really the uh, the um, the uh, Swiss Army knife of the Scions. Mm-hmm. Um, they have an ability that no one else has, which they could switch a psionic focus from one focused ability to another one. Mm-hmm. So at higher levels, they have more focused abilities than they have foci on purpose. Because the idea behind them is when they're going into a situation, if they have a minute or two, they could be like, hold on, guys. And they could rearrange their mental patterns. To fit what they're about to deal with. So give give them an example, Pete. So let's say that you have a guy who is um, who is a telekinetic and uh, a telekinetic and psychometabolism, which is abilities that you know boost your physical body. Mm -hmm. And he's about to go into a gladiatorial arena. He could be like. Give me a second, guys. He refocuses his abilities. He focuses on a power called Adrenaline Rush, another power called Iron Skin. So he can modify the little abilities he's focused on to fit that situation. Now, let's say there's another situation where he's dealing with um, – actually, let's – better yet. Let's say he's not he's not a telekinetic. Let's say he's um, – uh, what would be a good one? telepath no not telepath uh i'm thinking a what would be a good one let's say um oh my god my brain just went totally blank uh oh my god wow i just totally add'd henry the one that is about your senses Uh, clairsentience clairsentience Thank you. Let's say he's a clairsentient mm-hmm. and uh, and a uh, and a uh, psychokinetic, and you're in a dungeon environment, right? Well, they could be like, "Give me a second, guys," and switch from adrenaline rush to farsight and gain dark vision for a while, because that situation he's in. So mm-hmm. they're like a little Swiss Army knife of all these little focused abilities that they could pull upon. Uh, we have um, kind of like schools of magic. We call them gnosis mm-hmm. for each one of the disciplines of psionics. As a scion goes up in level, they get access to up to three of them. Every other class, all the other cl- the other two classes are restricted to one specialization. Mm-hmm. So they could pick up three of them. So they could be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. They're not fantastically focused on any of them. But they're like the jack of all trades for scions. And, and also, if I may interject, those three are not all equivalent to each other. <clears throat> so one's your primary, secondary, and tertiary. Mm-hmm. You will you'll max out your and when you hit you know, 20th level, let's say, you'll max out your primary. Yep. But your tertiary will never reach that same level mm-hmm. because you get it further down. Yeah. So the so, first one you pick is really important. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's a, it's like your main focus. Yeah. But right. you're not restricted to it. As you go up a level, you learn additional ones. Right. 
and now the uh, the Psy Warrior is opposed to that. Pete. Yeah. Um, okay. So the Psy Warrior um, is what it sounds like. It's a it's a fighter fighter type that mixes psionics into their melee abilities. Uh, they get only one gnosis, but they never get the higher level abilities of the gnosis. They only get up to a certain level, but they could smite psionically. They could use their focuses to hit harder. Um, and when they when they hit with the weapon, they could choose to either do force damage or psychic damage. Um, and each and they're charisma based, mm -hmm. but the archetypes really change the way that the class fights. In some cases, totally. Mm -hmm. Like Henry came up with this one freaking badass uh, archetype where they they use crystal, they mm -hmm. form crystal. Well, they could create these crystal gloves that they use in melee, and they could etch runes on them. Well, that. The entire arts, the arts, that entire art type is melee is is unarmed base. Well, there's another one that I created that um, I kind of kind of based off of the way I think it. it they're they're based totally off speed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all about fast movement. Uh, one of their highest level abilities, um, they could use one of their focuses once a day to literally blur in a 30 foot radius and hit every target around them once. Mm -hmm. They're all about speed. So when you build your psychic warrior, the archetype that you pick really changes the way your fighter feels. Um, there's one called the, uh, actually there's one that arcs that harkens back to 3.5, the war mind. Well, the way that we re envisioned them, they're the psionic tactician. They make everybody around them better. They're the leaders. So they can psionically guide somebody else's strike. Oh. And I, I um I can I can certainly dig that, especially especially since it se it seems that in the wake of fourth edition there's all there's been a bit of a itch that hasn't been fully scratched regarding regarding that old warlord concept. Oh uh, actually um Going back to our core campaign guide, mm -hmm. um, I agree with you, which is why in the uh, Arcanus campaign guide, mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a fighter which is inspired by that 3.5 class. Um, the uh, war the warlord wasn't in 3.5; that was in four. No, in fourth. You're yeah. right, but we have like a warlord mm -hmm. style uh, sub uh, subclass for the fighter. Yeah. Um... Now, now, I believe... And then there's the Wilder. Yes. So the Wilder mm -hmm. is... The idea of the Wilder is an untrained Scion. The other two Scions, at least in Arcanus, um, are following rigid family traditions. Or commonly held traditions held by all the families. If, hold on one second. Just to, let you, just to interject here real quick. And, and the other two classes, it's mm -hmm. uh, at least entertainers. Again, you can change this for whatever setting you want. Mm -hmm. The uh, the awakening that occurs is not a uh, a natural progression. It's not like uh, the mutants in Marvel who, uh, had, when they hit puberty, all of a sudden they ignite or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, your mind has to be um, awakened, and basically, you have somebody who is already awakened who goes in and basically, you know, pings your your brain, shatters it, and then helps you put it back together okay mm -hmm. uh allowing you to do all the things with the, the focus uh you know shattering your mind and having more than one uh your attention to more than one thing however there's another way that that can occur is that if you all for example all vowels as i mentioned are uh, have a latent ability to become awakened but they're not born that way and they may never be that way if you are attacked by let's say a uh, uh another uh awakened person or perhaps a creature like the voiceless ones that I mentioned or or some of the other things that we have running around um, and they attack you and you survive, well, your mind has been shattered already, but you have no one there with the experience to help you put it back together. So the, the wilder class is basically working off of raw emotion, raw instinct. And that's why Peter built this class in that matter. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, they are, again, they are charisma based. 
Uh, but when you read them, they don't have the flexibility of the Scion at all. And they don't have the uh, martial ability of the Psy Warrior. But they aren't constrained by the restrictions of tradition. Uh, they could do some things with their psionic powers that even though they look similar to what the Scion could do, they do it in their own unique way. Um, like they're like the Scion has a tele, a telekinetic, uh, or a subclass, right? The kineticist. Well, the wilder has their version of the te- kineticist, the brutal kineticist, which is just, again, brutal. It, it is, there's no finesse to it at all. Where the Scion is a scalpel, the wilder is a sledgehammer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the wilder, the, te- the telepathic wilder, um, damages people's minds when they use their telepathic abilities. Because again, it's total brutality. There's no finesse to it. Um, we have a mechanic that we uh, introduce in Codex of the Mind called Psychosis, mm-hmm. which uh, is a more granular level of getting madness. Because the way that madness works in three point in, in fifth edition, you just get it right. There's nothing leading up to it. There's no small shattering of the mind before you get there. So we created uh, the Psychosis system, which is five ranks. It works a lot like expression. I mean, um, mm-hmm. exhaustion. And every time when you start going up, you gain madness or you gain a compulsion, which your character can never really get rid of. And if you ever get to the highest level, you gain a permanent madness. Can it can I even be able to uh, remove the ma- uh, with magic? It's only removed for a little while. So like the most powerful magic could give you sanity for a few days if you ever get to rank five. Mm-hmm. So the idea of like certain sonic powers in the game is they could give you ranks of psychosis. And the wilder, the telepathic wilder, everything they touch with telepathic ability basically grants psychosis to the target and to themselves. Uh, the thing about the wilder is as they go up in level, they gain ranks of psychosis. They, they really can't do anything about uh, because their minds are unhinged. They were never trained to shatter their minds and put it back together. So they're just damaging themselves every time they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And the more powerful they get. And the thing is, it's not quite the way, the way that we describe it is not quite it's, it's unhinged, but they start to see, see things with disturbing clarity. Mm -hmm. Like where the world sees madness, they're like, no, this is exactly the way everything should be. Um, which creates some really interesting role-playing opportunities for the Wilder. Um, honestly, it's probably my favorite class, the way it came out in the end. Um, though I really like the Psy Warrior, but I think the Wilder was is probably the most fun to play. Now, with now with that kind of thing in mind, since you touched on that, mm-hmm. um, I would I um I would like to I would like to go for I would like to go further into um, to how you're, because you talk about expanding your madness rules. Um, yes. What's that? What is that going to be entailing? So, um, you have five ranks of psychosis that you could get, right? Um, the first rank, nothing really happens. Um, it's a little bit of a mental break. You can heal it with time. Um, but as you start going up, like you gain, I think at second, at second rank, you gain a compulsion. It's not a madness, a compulsion. The player can actually develop their own compulsion or. You could roll it or the GM. You know, it's something that you, the player and the GM should really work together. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be something like somebody doesn't want to let go of their lucky rabbit's foot. Something that small. Or it could be that, you know, somebody will somebody really can't sit with their back to a window anymore. Um, when I use psychosis, because I, I, I've been using it in a lot of my games, um, I like to try to base a psychosis after based on the event that triggered the psychosis. So, um, but that's, a, again, that's up to the player and the, and the GM. Mm-hmm. And then at third level, you gain a temporary madness, which could be healed with magic or time. But as you keep going up higher and higher, time doesn't do it anymore. You need magic. Mm-hmm. At rank five, you gain a permanent madness. And by the way, the madnesses are the ones right out of the DMG. 
Mm-hmm. But the permanent madness, the way it works in the psychosis rules, you can't get rid of it. You have it forever. Your mind is broken, and magic only fixes it for a short time. So getting up the five ranks of psychosis, first of all, isn't easy. Um, mm-hmm. I ran a, to play test it. I ran a campaign for a good like eight months. They were getting together every every week to play, and because the rules of you could use time. Time, uh, time, uh, off time, um, time off mm-hmm. to heal it or magic. Um, it nobody ever got above three psychosis, but my players really started to dig the compulsions, uh, because the entire campaign dealt with the silence, and the silence, you know, you meet oblivion, it's going to shatter your mind a little bit. Um, but they really started to dig the compulsions, and it added something to every character. Um, so yeah, that's basically what the psionic rules. It's, it's, it uses the core psionic rules and it overlays on top of them. Oh, you mean the madness rules? Mm-hmm. The madness rules. It uses the madness rules and overlays on top of them. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Oh, yeah. Go. No, and the way you get psychosis, everything that could give you psychosis has a saving throw. It's not just you get a rank of psychosis. The only exception to that is when you go up levels of Wilder. Mm-hmm. There's levels of Wilder that says you gain a rank of Psychosis. Now, <clears throat> with the, with that in with that in mind, mm-hmm. um, when it comes to one of the things that I'd li- one of the things I'd like to go a bit fu- a bit further into is psionic dueling. Um, this this idea of of me- this idea of mental one on one mano a mano um, mm-hmm. setups. Um, now, as some as somebody who's dipped into stuff like L five R and Seventh C, I'm no stranger when it comes to the concept of du- of dueling mechanics. But I'd be curious how you how you guys are handling it when it comes to this idea of using the mind for it, both well, in um in a narrative and a mechanical sense. Since it's one of those things that's kind of it's kind of tricky to for GMs mm-hmm. to describe at times. Um, well, you want to start with narrative and then okay. Um, one of the, are you familiar with Shadowrun? Yes. Okay. One of the biggest problems that I had with Shadowrun in the very, very, very beginning, and not just me, but basically everybody I knew, was when the um, uh, the Cyber Decker would go into cyberspace and do his or her bit, mm-hmm. right? Everybody else was doing what Peter's doing right now, which is just twiddling their thumbs and doing nothing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Like I said, and spare prick at the was- wedding. And they would go. Somebody, somebody would get coffee. Somebody, and by, time, and by doing that, it basically broke the cohesion of the story. And you know, as I'm sure you and and perhaps your listeners know by now, we're all about the story, and we don't want to do that. So, our psionic dueling is only used in, as at least in our case, obviously, the rules are there. You can do whatever the heck you want. But the way we use it to avoid that is it's only used in very specific. Uh, uh, situations we you know it's a ritualized dueling and you know i wrote this little bit where it basically says this should be used as either a character arc uh climax or a um or a point of of great tension uh where two people um an npc you know, an adversary a minor adversary and the uh and the hero as we call our pcs uh finally you know have it out between the two or it could have a it could be a momentary blip where it's where um, they have a, a little, you know, bouncing off each other, but they don't fight to the to the end. Um, because, let's face it, when that happens, it's just two people look, you know, in, in, in the story terms, just two people looking at each other, not really going on all up. Whereas, and the gaming table, everybody else is just going to be sitting there twiddling their thumbs. So we don't want that. So it should only be used in climaxes where everybody has a vested interest in seeing how this ends. Which brings in everybody else, you know, who's sitting at the table. Hopefully, will be in, intrigued by what's going on. So, and to avoid just making it a dice rolling um, uh, exercise, uh, we came up with something a little different. So, Pete, go for it. The so, uh, yeah. So the way it works mechanically, uh, you only could do a psychic duel if both people agree. You can't force somebody into a psychic duel. Mm-hmm. Uh, the psychic duels are presented as an optional rule. The GM could use it if they want to or not. And the way it works is, uh, as you go up in level, 
uh, if the optional rules in play, you learn not psionic, psychic. You learn psychic attacks and psychic defenses. Mm -hmm. Arcing this, if you played uh, first edition psionics, mm -hmm. you'll know exactly where this is coming from. So as you go up a level, you learn psionic attacks and defenses, stuff that you are trained in. And the interesting thing is that uh, the Psy Warrior and the Scion learn them at a good regular ra rate. Mm -hmm. The Wilder, not so much because they've never been trained. They basically work off instinct, so they don't get all the psionic attack and defenses. Um, and it, it it almost works like a like a miniature game off the side. Uh, the attacker and the defender mm -hmm. uh, basically put down, you know, you pick a sonic attack and a sonic mm -hmm. defense, and there's an effect. And it works kind of like death saving throws. Three strikes, you're out. Mm -hmm. So basically, you put down an attack. I put down defense. I, well, I, I mentioned defense. You mentioned an attack. You know, you write down an attack. We turn it over. And there's an effect. Either you deal point of damage to me, or I defend it, or mm -hmm. in some cases, because I picked just the right one, I can hit you. And it keeps going back and forth until it's over. It runs really fast, mm -hmm. and um, and it it's a it takes place like in a mental plane. So anybody outside just sees two people stare at each other for a split second, mm -hmm. and like one person backs off. Um. If you go all the way to three stri three hits, you fall unconscious and you start dying. But at any point, whoever's on the on the deep on the attack could just back out. Yeah. So you find some you find that you're fighting somebody way above your ability. You could be like, okay, I'm done. You win. So it's a it's more of a story based mechanic, not a combat based mechanic. And with given and given that given that um, it's it sounds like the it sounds like the way you're setting it up this isn't this isn't going to be the length lengthy lengthy drawn out and that and then and then a burst like like say a good like say a good old fashioned pistols at noon kind of thing oh no no or, or anything like that it is it is I guess it I guess it is ver it is very much a case of draw and then th and then it and then it happens ve yeah very quick. Um the the when I play tested it, the longest psychic duel that lasted for me I think was something like three minutes, and that's because we were describing what we were doing. And which I think is an important portion of uh, part of this thing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, really interesting. You really need player the the player who's who's involved in this to to describe. Hey, I'm throwing up a, you know, a an iron fortress or or whatever you know whatever attack that they're doing an eagle whip. Mm -hmm. And describe the the effect, and, and the GM obviously will do the same thing back. That makes it interesting for the people who are sitting at the table, also like, mm -hmm. oh, cool, how they're doing this and that. Um, yeah, Rather the entire than... thing when it happens on a psychic plane. One of the interesting things we wrote is that um, if there's a third scion there, and the third the third scion has the psychic link ability, you could draw all the players to watch the psychic duel. In the mental plane. Yeah. yeah. And okay. so you could like really tell some interesting stories. Um, because when we describe psychic combat, mm -hmm. it's almost like um uh, like Neo and and Morpheus when they fight in the dojo. Mm -hmm. It's like that. They create a psychic construct and they fight in there and stuff that can't happen, the normal D D rules could happen in there easily. Yeah. Which um as soon as you mentioned that, I immediately ended up thinking of the line of "Come on, stop trying to hit me and hit me." Exactly. Um, because the thing that the thing that's always tricky about uh, about psionics mm -hmm. is first first off, it's uh, it's full of its full effects are very difficult to present visually, which is yeah. which is why when you see when you see psionics in say film or television or the like. Usually, it's either mind reading or te or um te or telekinesis mm -hmm. or something that in in other situations might just might just be a standard internal superpower. Yeah. Um. There are some films that have there are some more experimental films that have that have attempted it, but 
Well, unfortunately, one of those films is Zardoz, so we're not so we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I feel I can anybody who hasn't seen Zardoz consider yourself blessed. I don't. Uh, one thing we did was um, okay, so um, you know, spellcasting has uh, material components. Yes. So what we did was th- when you manifest a spell or any ability, mm-hmm. um, it it has a manifestation. Uh, um, it could be visual, mental, or mental is material, visual is vocal, and which is the last one? Vocal, mental, I am mean, material and, and core. Mater- um, material. Material, com- material components it becomes um, mental. Vo- vocal, vocal, comp- um, vocal components and becomes soma- visual and somatic, sonic. So, depending on what you and by the way, it's up to the player to describe the effect, right? So, let's say that I'm going to use um, that I'm going to use uh, te- a telekinetic blast, right? Well, my my component, my my manifesting component is visual. So the way I describe it is that you see all the small untied objects float in the air right before the air ripples and hits you. Mm-hmm. It's up to the player to describe it, but it's something that you can't hide. So uh, mental is like everybody hears like a ping in their mind or whispers or or something. Or or oh, headache. yeah. Or you they get a dull headache. Um so that's how we kind of give the psionics their look. We get the classic three components and we turn them into manifestations. Uh, so it's easy to convert a spell like fireball into uh, into a psionic ability. It looks different. Yeah, it uses the same mechanics, but it looks different because it has now a mental component and a and a visual component. Um, and then the, the other sonic abilities, like the focused abilities, each, every time you you manifest, you focus on an ability. There's a mental uh, expression, a, a mental ping, or a mental. Everybody gets a headache or something. You describe it as a character. Um, like I, there's one person at my table that described it as uh, as an echoing wisp, uh, echoing uh, whistle. Every time they manifested a focused ability. So you could really come up with some cool stuff that fits your character, um, but it's it's supposed to be obvious that somebody just manifested a sonic ability somewhere in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing I, sh- I should mention is Peter's mentioned it a few times. Uh, one of the benefits that we have um, is that we play tested the heck out of the system. Uh, besides, <laughs> personally, play testing in, in his own home campaign, and now we've been doing that ourselves in our, our campaigns, although it's been difficult with, uh, with this, uh, you know, the virus, uh, the pandemic going on. Um, one of the beauties of the living campaign is that we were able to have hundreds of players playing this, you know, or just, you know, taking the, the, the main, uh, science rules, you know, the, the nuts and bolts and putting it through spaces mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to break it because we have people who go out of their way to try to break systems and anything that they found, we obviously, take back, we incorporate, we change, and we put it back out. So for over the past four years, if not more, maybe closer to five, but literally, uh, I can or I can safely say four years solid, uh, the science rules have been uh, play tested by, you know, everybody in our in our uh, living campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so far, everybody seems to really enjoy it. Yep. So you won't be getting a, a non-tested... Uh, oh, no, it's been, just, been tested to the ground. <laughs> You'll get something that's that's solid. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, um, one particular threat that's uh, that's it that's going to be in Codex of the Mind that I'm, I'd I'd like to I'd like to hear the expansion of because, while while there's all while there's plenty of talk all all the time when it comes to when it comes to the player facing end of psionics when it comes to the monster facing end the GM end of it, and and the kind of th- and the kind of psionic threats that can be done there. Um, that's something that isn't discussed as much. 
And I'd l and because of because of that, obviously, I'm using this as a lead in to ask about the silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, I love the silence. Well, the silence has has a player facing uh, uh, aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because while it's not allowed in the living campaign for obvious reasons, um, but since this is based off of um, or the foundation is the um, uh, the sorcerer, correct me, correct me yep. if I'm wrong. The the sorcerer. Uh, no, the uh, warlock. I'm sorry, the warlock, mm -hmm. uh, and how that works. The silence can be a patron for you, mm -hmm. and you and you can you don't have to be a vow. You could be. You know, normal human being who has absolutely no chance of having psionics, and you would be granted abilities by this this patron of yours. This you know, this uh, it may not it's not actually the silence, not oblivion, but one of their mm -hmm. servants. Uh, and you're given what we call preternatural psionics, and it has a its own twist. It's psionics; so you pick the same class or the same abilities and whatnot, but it's a it's a little different uh, flavor, if you will. But that's more of a role playing. Uh, hook and whatnot. Mechanically, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as monsters, though, uh, we have quite a few monsters that are um, uh, psionically enhanced, I guess you, you call it. Like I mentioned, the Sanu, but definitely the, the you know, the, the big, big one is the Servants of the Silence or the Servants of Oblivion, of which mm -hmm. the biggest one is the Voiceless Ones, who are very, very uh, creepy creatures that, given their name, they make absolutely no noise or sound whatsoever, even when they're in pain or when they're struck or when they're attacking. There's no, there's no sound uh, emanating from them. You know, it's almost as, as if they're incapable of doing so. Um, and hence the name, the voiceless ones. That's not mm -hmm. something they call themselves. That's what people call them. So besides being just scary physically, they're also able to do quite a few um, uh, psionic uh, attacks and defenses and whatnot. Pete, how do we handle that? Well, they, they have sign, they have psychic abilities, like psychic powers, but they use their spell levels to manifest. Um, they also have access. <laughs> they also have access to uh, the warlock because I love when we wrote this. They have access to unique. Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. E uh, 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 evo uh, evocations. That they can eat the brains of individuals and uh, take their memories. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really creepy. Um, the, the silence, uh, as far as the voiceless ones, when they use their psionics, um, their psionics are devilishly difficult for anybody who's not a scion to counter or to dispel. Because uh -huh. the magic doesn't follow the same rules of the universe but i think uh i think what he's asking is how mechanically what's the stat block like to to reflect the psionics correct oh uh, well the way that stat well, block works is, is that, is that they actually am I, hold on Pete. Oh, is that correct or am i misunderstanding yeah yeah okay. that's that's one that's one thing and also uh, that's one aspect and also um also the kind of also the kind of psionically inclined um, threats that ca that can occur, whether they be monsters or um, phenomena. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, well, oh, phenomenon. We actually have a few psychic diseases <clears throat> which <laughs> only people who are awakened could get. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But the... So uh, okay, so monster stat blocks, right? Um, they're given a number of focuses, which they use up like spell levels and sonic powers. So uh, le let's say the hypothetically as a voiceless one uh, mind uh, overlord, which is like uh, they're like the puppeteers, uh, would have a few telepathic psychic powers, and they would have a certain amount of focus of, of mental foci they could expend. They don't have mental. They don't have focused abilities. They just have abilities that are on all the time. They don't need to shatter their mind like a like a player scion. They just are. So uh, when you fight a, a psychically awakened creature, uh, they would have psychic powers, like in the Sonics book. Psychic powers are um, they're not for they're formatted kind of like. Okay, so the best way I can describe it is 
imagine a cantrip that at the bottom says, if you use a spell level of first level or above, this happens. If you use a spell level this level or above, this happens. If you use second, third, fourth, all the way to fifth. So, like, um, some powers mm -hmm. will give you a few spells that you can manifest because they kind of fit the overall thing. For example, pyrokinesis, right? Pyrokinesis is a fireball. Um, if you use a, if you're, if you can manifest a second level spell, you could do scorching ray. If you manifest a fifth level spell, you could do firewall. Wall of fire. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, it, but it's all under that power. So psychic monsters have a few of those powers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they can manifest as a sonic ability. Uh, one thing about manifestation, um, because of the way you manifest, if you tie a scion's hands together and gag them, they could still manifest their abilities. Yep. Psychic monsters have the same mm -hmm. problem for player characters. And one of the th one of the things I'm one of the things I'm curious about on that fr on that front is. Mm -hmm. um, Given given the three components that you that you mentioned, mm -hmm. are there means or builds to um to be to allow someone to cast while cir while circumventing some of them, like say, be able to be able to cast um certain spells without provoking, um say Sonic, i.e. Yes. Um. Okay. So there's two ways around that. Mm -hmm. The first one is if you learned the gnosis of metapsionics. The gnosis of metapsionics is a uh, uh, a school of altering the way you manifest your psionics. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their abilities is to suppress one of their uh, their uh, their manifestation uh, signatures. They can mana They could. Another one we have, which is an optional rule, is a skill check. Because well. Going back a little bit, in Arcanus, Arcane spellcasters are actively hunted down. So mm -hmm. they have learned over the years how to hide their spellcasting through skill. Um, it's a high skill check, mm -hmm. but it's even higher for Scions because it's very difficult for them to be able to hide their manifestation signatures. But they can if that optional rule is in play. So there's two ways to do it. There's going, using up one of your gnosises to do metapsionics, which the only one that can actually do that is a scion. Uh, the Psy Warrior can never learn metapsionics. Mm -hmm. And the Wilder cannot, the Wilder actually learns metapsionics off the bat because mm -hmm. they're not restricted by the traditions of psionics. They think outside the box. Mm -hmm. So those two could, at higher levels, Turn off one of their uh, expression, one of their manifestation signatures. Yeah. Now, since since no, since gnosis has been has been kind of mentioned as and, and is some and is somewhat tied to um to to the to the disciplines, which the disciplines as far as far as as far as I'm seeing are are kind of the sister to the um, magical spheres. Um, Correct. I'd like to I'd like to go through the, go through those and what and what someone who's an adept at um at one at those kind of disciplines would potentially do. Since at the end of, at the end of the day, even though pe even though people might even though um certain characters might dip into a variety of disciplines, there's going to mm -hmm. be one that wins out. Oh, I, I was I was I was really careful about that. Um. That's one of the things about the playtesting is that uh, the players automatically, because players do this, mm -hmm. uh, they will gravitate toward one or the other. Um, and then we were able to, you know, play around with um, different power levels, different levels to try and make everything work out. Uh, but yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. So I was opening up the PDF so I could go through some of the gnosis with you real yeah. quick. Yeah. Um now I'm gonna I'm gonna be going down by the down by the order of um, disciplines, so we yes. can go, so we can go into what it kind of entails and 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 the like. Um, yeah. So, 
Starting at the top is clairsentience. Yes. So clairsentience is all about ex- uh, expanding your perceptions. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not it's not a purely non-offensive uh, non-offensive gnosis for example one of the uh one of the spells that they learn how to manifest as a spell like a, as a as a sonic ability is guiding bolt um but psychic focus like focused abilities they get mm-hmm. um like one of the abilities is uh if they touch a wall and they spend an action they could quote unquote see ten feet beyond the wall mm-hmm. into the other room. They could give themselves dark vision, expanded sight. Um, hold on a second, because I, I went to open it and I opened the wrong PDF. Give me one second. So. Um, I completely ADD. I'm trying to find it. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry. My mind is off to the side sometimes. Okay, so yeah, their abilities are mostly um, divination and mm-hmm. senses, but not to a point where it, you know, they're not offensive in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, here we go. Clear clear instance. So to give you an idea, uh, they could do guiding bolt. They could do clairvoyance, of course. Um, But like uh, here, heightened heightened awareness. There's a focused ability. You could substitute your manifesting ability score for your wisdom for your passive and active ability checks involving perception. So as long as you're focused on there, let's say that you're an intelligence-based Scion, the savant, you use your intelligence instead of your wisdom on perception rules as long as you're focused on it. Mm-hmm. Um, at the highest levels, um, we have a new spell that you could manifest called Fate of One. Um, I like this one. Um, they get, they get. 6th, 7th, and 8th, and ninth level manifestations, mm-hmm. each only once a day, kind of like what the Warlock does. Um, uh, send, uh, inflict sensory overload. Basically, you manifest feeble mind on somebody as a clear essence power. Because so you, you break <clears throat> their mind. Um, yeah, I, I, I think if you go through each and every one, we're, we're going to be... No, that's it. That's it. I was only picking two. Uh, yeah. No, I'm talking about the rest, <laughs> the rest yeah. also. Oh. So. Uh, meta creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all about like uh, doing stuff with psi crystals uh, that they manifest out of thin air. They have a they kind of have a familiar a psi crystal that they can mm-hmm. manifest. Um, they could uh, they could create like uh, walls of force uh, stuff like that. That one of their main abilities. Um, oh, every gnosis has something called a persistent ability, which is one ability that's always on. Right. Mm-hmm. Meta creation creates crystalline armor that improves as they go up in level. Mm-hmm. And- um, Metasionics, I already told you, that's mm-hmm. kind of like me- messing around with psionics. Mm-hmm. Um, the best way to describe it is almost like metamagic for psionics, where all the abilities let you alter the way a spell or a power works. Mm-hmm. Um one of the one of the abilities, for example, called split focus. Uh, if you have a focused ability, you can dedicate one of your mental focuses to keeping that focused ability active, but only one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then cycle metabolism. We already went over that. You have uh, adrenaline rush, which gives you a boost to your uh, to your. Uh, it, it's almost like barbarian rage, except you get a level of exhaustion when you're done because it totally just taps you. Mm-hmm. Um, and also that one has a lot of healing abilities and stuff that you only could do to yourself. You can't use it on other people. It's all about you. Um, psychoportation is about movement and teleportation, small short distances or teleporting others. 
Um, there's an ability called spatial rec- uh, repositioning, which you can grab two allies and swap them. Mm-hmm. Um, telekinesis. Everybody knows what telekinesis could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to give you an example of something interesting they could do, they have an ability called tactile telekinesis, which they could use their telekinesis to search an area because they could feel through it. Mm-hmm. Um, telepathy. Everybody knows telepathy. Uh, one of the abilities in it is called look elsewhere. When somebody comes to attack you, you fill them with doubt. And if they miss a saving throw, they don't attack you and go to attack somebody else. Um, and that's it. That's all of them. Now, with now with that with all of that in, with all of that in mind, um, mm-hmm. I on the magic item end of things. Yes. Or um, now, obviously, obviously, there's our fair share of magic items. But what I'm what I'm specifically curious about is the concept of psionic runes. Since yes. Runes is some runes are something that are that are um are not uncommon to fantasy, but but they're always they're always in the very magical end of things. So narratively, what would be the difference between the typical kind of rune that that say dwarves are famous for of the of casting magic into an object and well, the, and this sort of and these sort of psionic runes. Okay, so we introduced uh, our own runic system in um in Forged in Magic, which was our magic item book, which was like the first book we did for fifth edition. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, there are a bunch of runes that you could put on non magical items, and depending on the type of item it's put on, the ability changes. So, like a fire rune on a sword acts differently than a fire that same fire rune on armor, or on a spellcasting focus. Psionic runes work that same way, but all of them have an additional ability that if you use a psionic focus on the rune, something happens. So, like the runes, imagine somebody carved a rune, but they're infused with psychic power. Mm-hmm. And they have very psychic uh, feel feeling abilities to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how we kind of made them unique to uh, to um, to our normal rune system. And we kind of did that with magic. A lot of magic, the magic, the psionic magic items, non scions could use them. But in a lot of cases, if a non scion uses them, they gain a level, a rank of psychosis. Mm-hmm. And they can't use it as well as a scion. Um, for example, we have uh, we have like uh, we have so- one item that comes to mind. Uh, anybody could use the the armor. I mean the um, this uh, psychic skin. But if you're non scion, you gain a level of psychosis, and you only could use its ability once per short rest. Mm-hmm. But if you're a scion, you don't gain a rank of psychosis. You could use its ability once per short rest, and you could use your mental focus to use it more times. Mm-hmm. So it's just better on a Scion, but a non-Scion could use it. We didn't want to cut anybody who wasn't Psionic out of using the items. That may, that may, that uh, makes that makes sense. Now, <clears throat> now, um. I, now, obvi- obviously, a good obviously a good chunk of the subclasses are going to be dedicated to these to these new base classes, and I'm and I'm not going to go through all of the subclasses, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but give but um, would it, but are you are you planning on giving every base class some degree of subclass representation? Well, we didn't give every subclass, but we gave a few of them. Like uh, there is. Uh, there's a clerical one. Mm-hmm. There's one for barbarians, uh, which we call Furies and Arcanus, because mm-hmm. barbarian is more of a cultural tag, and Fury actually kind of fits the world, the story behind it. Yeah. Uh, there's one for rangers. Uh, there's one for rogues. Actually, there's two for rangers. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's two for rangers. You're right. There's mm-hmm. two for rangers. There's one for rogue, and then there's the warlock, patron of the silence. Oh. Um, Just so we th- have some of the core classes represented, not all of them. Mm-hmm. Just out of curiosity, because I have to work my gimmick, yes. is there one for monks? Not yet. It's a stretch goal. All well, right. wait, let me back up. 
monks as a as a class does not exist in Arcanus. Stop! We're going to get kicked off the podcast, Henry. No, no, you're not going to get kicked. <laughs> well, well, he, he said he knows about. He says he knows about uh, Arcanus. So, I mean, he's, he's, I'm sure he knows this. Yes. The reason why the whole the whole focusing of chi or whatnot just doesn't it doesn't fit with what you know the way magic works in Arcanus and whatnot. Mm-hmm. However, monks as a tradition, yes, exists. Okay, but we have a stretch goal called Tome of the Mind, which is basically we take everything that's in the Codex of the Mind, strip out any and everything from Arcanus out of it, mm-hmm. leaving you just with a generic, or as we call it, a setting agnostic rule set. Mm-hmm. And one of the stretch goal is to add things that normally would not be in Arcanus. For example, the monk, mm-hmm. uh, a psionic monk, a psionic uh, wizard, mm-hmm. you know, that, that sort of thing. That doesn't fit in Arcanus, but does fit in a more of a, like I said, setting agnostic. You know, here are the rules for everything. Here are all your options. Mm -hmm. So it'll be in that stretch goal. Now, with now with that kind of thing in mind, so you, um, so at at the time of at the time of this recording, I do want to give my congrats that that um you guys have managed to get managed to get um over your initial um initial goal. Mm-hmm. Since at the time at this time it's at twenty six point one thousand. Yep. Um. Now, obvi- obviously, ev- obviously, these kind of things are always going to be in flux. But what are you shooting for as far as the PDF release at the at the least? Oh, date wise. Not oh, just like. a, just in terms of a general range. Not anything. Not a specific date. Well, we have we put down August of twenty twenty two. And the yep. reason we did that is because we know that people get very antsy when we give a very accurate or, or try to do as accurate as possible. And then something happens, right? Life happens. The nice thing about, about this is right now that the manuscript is done mm-hmm. and it's in its third, um, third uh, pass of, of editing. Uh, the reason we have the Kickstarter is because we need the art and we need to print, mm-hmm. obviously, and layout, and we need to print the, the, uh, the book. Mm-hmm. And until we have, you know, the the funds, we can't start getting the uh, the art in. So as soon as the art is, as soon as the Kickstarter is over, which is another, I think we have three weeks, twenty days, twenty days, twenty days, twenty, 20, days. 20, 20 days. days and change. <clears throat> uh, when that gets, when the money gets uh, transferred to us, we can start hiring the artists, paying them for it, and um, at that point, we'll lay the book out, and then we usually send out a beta to all our backers to make sure we haven't missed anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, we give everybody about uh, at least a couple weeks to go through it and make sure there's nothing you know, that we missed or whatnot. Because uh, 100 pairs of eyes is a, is a lot better than you know seven pairs of eyes. Yep. So, um, and then it goes to the printer. Obviously, when we send the, the, the PDF to the printer to print, that's it. <laughs> there's no more changes. Yeah. So at that point, we'll send, send that out. It is my hope that it'll be out before the end of the year. But again, you know, we're at, at the vagaries of, you know, the artists, if, if they have, uh, you know, we hire a guy and he flakes out or we hire somebody else and, you know, they have an issue where something comes up or they have another client that, that has issues or whatnot. Yep. So that's why I am, I put the, the, the deadline so far in advance that I know we're going to make it, you know, barring, mm-hmm. you know, the apocalypse um, for both the printing and obviously printing, as you know, um, or as, I hope you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, shipping everywhere is a complete mess for everyone uh, that are printing overseas. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what we can do there. We're we're shopping around to different uh, printers, but we have we have a printer that we like right now that gives us a spectacular quality. Uh, however, with uh, you know the the way the shipping is right now, it's it, I'm not sure if we're going to go with it or not. So I'm trying to find another printer that's. Um, that can produce at the same quality, uh, level quality, um, but will get us the books at a, a shorter time frame. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why I'm hesitant to give anybody an exact, an exact date. It is my hope, it is my hope that everybody will have the PDF before the end of the year. You know? yeah. uh, hopefully, well before the end of the year, but I don't know. That's why I put August 2022, because yeah. <laughs> I do know we'll have it by then. So, yeah. Yeah. One of the main goals we had was to have the manuscript written before we even started the Kickstarter. 
just yeah. because of this. Exactly. So, yeah. We want to make sure that there's, you know, that it would not be held up because of writing. So exactly. The manuscript is 100% done. The only thing that's not done is a stretch goal that we have, which is the uh, expanding the monster section mm -hmm. um, yeah. to 16 pages and then 32 pages, uh, additional pages. Which, if we hit that one, the book should be somewhere between 224 and 256 pages. So it'll be pretty meaty. Yeah. Um, but I already have notes on what I want there anyway, so it shouldn't be hard to to you know, write those up and get that out. Get that mm -hmm. out. So that's not that difficult. So. No. So yeah. And yeah. we're on the way right now to our first stretch, but we're actually we're less than than a hundred. Uh, no, actually we're less than a few hundred dollars away from the VTT tokens because we do have a Discord channel, mm -hmm. or actually we don't. The company doesn't. Yeah. Uh, some uh, very loyal uh, uh, players uh, have created a Discord channel just for Arcanus, and they've been running games very free. Non-stop, games. Multiple, yeah. multiple games, multiple games. So um, if anybody's interested in that, they can always um, look for it, or I guess we can put it on our Kickstarter. I'll do an update with it. Um, when I talk about the VTT tokens, then I'll have the, the invite to the Discord channel there. Yeah, and multiple, ga multiple games means multiple opportunities for them to be cursed by the dice gods. Yes. Oh, who, oh who am I kidding? The dice gods hate everybody. It's actually, it's actually a um. I actually, I actually find the hatred that the dice gods have for everyone is kind of inspiring because, no matter who you are, where you come from, or what you do, um, they hate you, and they yes. want you to suffer. Unless I GM, then they're very good with me. They're, they're, they're horrible. Good. No, 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 Henry. They're horrible with us. <laughs> I swear to God, Henry has loaded dice. <laughs> Every but everybody says that their GM has loaded dice. Sometimes, sometimes I'll just, sometimes I'll just roll. I'll just roll just because I feel like rolling because I know it makes my players paranoid. Oh Be my god, yes, that's one of the oldest trick in the book. Um, or in in um in in other in other cases, I'd um I'd 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 um not, I'd not do I'd not do anything, and I'd and I'd still manage to find a way to make them paranoid. Um. The only the only downside is that because of that I had to um I had to ban the use of spot checking because everybody kept everybody kept assuming that every five foot square had some kind of trap. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that, the issue with traps. Yeah. Like I'm like I'm running Tomb of Horrors or some shit. Yeah. I get it. Um, but with that with that said, I'll cert I'm certainly gonna be keeping an eye on how how it how it um develops. Right. But. I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedules to come on to the show and enjoy the enjoy the madness at play here. Anytime. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank and, you very much for inviting us. Yeah, yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As well, I often you. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We really had a good time. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>